The woods hold many mysteries that to this day will bring chills to its many visitors. Whether you're camping, going backpacking, or you work for the Forest Service as a park ranger, the creepy things you can encounter are waiting just around the corner. That's why on today's episode of Scary Stories, we'll be taking a listen to stories from park rangers as well as the wilderness. By the way, if you'd like to be featured on a future episode, then make sure to send your story in with my user submissions email, tcfnarrations at gmail.com. But just remember, because we don't like to feature repeated stories on this channel, make sure your submission hasn't been sent in to another narrator or posted online. That way we have a wonderful listening experience. But enough of that, let's jump right into it. Number 1. Colt in the Woods Before I start, I want to preface with the following statement. In no way, shape, or form do I gain anything from making any of this story up. This is based off true events that I experienced with fellow park rangers who are also willing to back up my story. But more than anything, I'm writing this story in to hopefully hear from someone who might recognize this group or maybe have more information. If you do have more information, I'll look at the comments section and I'll provide you with more details. But anyways, let me get started. Back in the early 2000s, I used to be a park ranger that patrolled and worked in state parks in southern Alaska. During my almost 30-year career, I was witness to many heart-racing moments, including once where I had a close encounter with some bears who were this close to tearing me to shreds. But perhaps it's not so much what scares Mother Nature can provide you with, more so people and their ever-longing goals to chill you to the bone. Well, wouldn't you know, the Alaskan wilderness isn't home to just animal encounters. Now, I forget exactly what year it was, but it was definitely during the spring. So we're talking about mid-April, early May, when temperatures were a comfortable 50 degrees. Anyways, I was on patrol with another park ranger after sunset, and as we drove around checking in on the campers scattered around the woods, we came into contact with one group in particular who called us over. They mentioned how earlier in the day, they saw some strange individuals with black clothing and robes carrying torches and shotguns. If these individuals, according to the backpackers, were some sort of hunters, it definitely sounded as if they weren't dressed for the part. But forget hunting clothing. This area was off limits to hunting, which meant we could give them a huge fine. If not, a trip to jail for violating park rules. So with that, we thanked them for the information, and then we got on our radios to advise other park rangers within the vicinity of this strange sighting. No one had seen them, which made it our mission to locate these people and figure out what exactly they might be up to. Fast forward about 30 minutes of searching, and two other park rangers have now joined our search. Eventually, we come across a restricted part of the woods that has a fence surrounding it. What we noticed was part of the fence had been cut, just enough for someone or someones to make their way in. We once again called it into our park ranger station, before the four of us make our way in on foot. Now, before continuing, I should mention that we were armed, with pistols at least. Might not seem like the best protection, but something is better than nothing. Anyways, after no more than five to seven minutes of walking and searching, we could see a small light coming through some bushes in the distance. As we got closer, we were able to see smoke, which we associated with a campfire. We then got further confirmation when we reach a campsite. Let's just say, it was really creepy. There was a giant pentagram spray painted on the ground, with candles surrounding its circumference. We also saw a bunch of strange looking dolls, knives, and a bunch of beer bottles. Very weird. But then things got worse when we started to hear somebody approaching. We each took out our pistols and we form a defensive position when about 10 robed individuals pop out of nowhere. 
At least five of them were armed with shotguns, and a few others had some knives. Instinctively, my partner asked who they were, but they remained silent. Ten to fifteen seconds of this awkward stare down, we hear somebody tell the strangers to stand down, before another robed individual reveals himself. This one was dressed in a red robe, unlike the others who were dressed in all black. He also had a skull mask. We were guessing he must have been the leader of the group. Anyways, he proceeds to inform us that they had been camping out here as part of a members-only society demonic group, his words not mine, and they didn't want to be disturbed, which was why they came all the way out here. Surprisingly, he was really calm, and he talked in a way as if he had practiced this sort of response before. He tells us that they had no clue the area was off-limits, and they said they were willing to comply with the rules, as well as clean up after themselves. They even presented the proper documentation for the weaponry. So far it seemed to all check out, apart from them just being a bunch of weirdos. Anyways, we still wrote up a citation after escorting them back to their vehicles. Fast forward a couple of days later, and I did some more research into the group with the information they provided. It turned out they were part of some weird cult who would go out every month to do their strange rituals using dolls. Now, it's been almost two decades since I last saw them, and it's only up to a month ago I tried doing more research, but since I don't remember everything, I haven't been able to find any more information. As I don't remember their name, there's not much in form of proof I can provide, other than my fellow park rangers, who are once again willing to back me up. Like I mentioned at the beginning, if you have any more information, or this sounds familiar to you, or you're from the Sitka area, leave a comment so I can give you more details. I'd really like to get to the bottom of this after so many years of unanswered questions. Number 2. Nature Fights Back Ever since I was a child, I was always fascinated with the great outdoors. That's why my dad and I would at least spend one weekend out of every month going camping in the Minnesotan wilderness. It's here he would teach me about survival, wildlife, as well as the many morals and life lessons I still practice with my children to this very day. Those moments are fleeting memories that I'll often reminisce about while lying in bed. And it's also one of the reasons I wanted to give back. It's why I studied to become a park ranger, and at this very moment I'm a lead ranger who works in the education department. Now, while my job consists of fairly common routine work, such as providing guided trips and tours, there are some occasions where my life, as well as others, were in quite the predicament. I just finished giving a tour to a 7th grade class, and I was sitting in my vehicle, enjoying my lunch break, which consisted of a tuna sandwich my wife had packed me. All of a sudden, I began to hear what sounded like meowing, coming from a nearby shed that I was parked next to. I was able to determine the source of the noise as a wild cat, and I could tell it might have been in some sort of distress. Sure enough, I find a mountain lion cub, who had appeared to have gotten stuck in one of the metal pipes. Luckily, it took me no more than 10 seconds to get the little guy out of there, but that would be the least of my concern. When I turned my attention to the nearby foliage, I was able to see two of the largest mountain lions I'd ever seen in my career. Fight or flight immediately goes into effect as I put the pieces together. I was holding their kid, and these were the parents. Time seemed to go into a standstill as I watched the mountain lions charge toward me with their razor-sharp fangs showing in all. It wasn't until they were a few feet from where I was standing that my brain finally tells me let go of the mountain lion and run. But where do I go? My vehicle was way too far for me to sprint to it. And besides, there is no chance I would outrun them. So that left me with only one other option. The shed. But was it unlocked? If it wasn't, that was going to be it for me. I placed my hand on the door handles, and to my surprise, it's unlocked. I swing that bad boy open, and as I go to close it behind me, I feel one of the sharpest pains across my back. I hadn't realized it due to all the adrenaline, 
but one of the mountain lions had actually managed to get me with their sharp claws. And boy oh boy, let me tell you, the scar they left behind was pretty insane. Nevertheless, the mountain lions continued to scratch and claw at the shed's door until I heard a car horn. It was one of my fellow park rangers who managed to catch a glimpse of me entering the shed. I'm just so thankful because I truly believe the mountain lions would have eventually clawed their way through. Well, maybe not, but as this was happening, I was seriously thinking of it. Finally, when the coast is clear, my heart begins to relax. The pain begins to set in. I ended up going to the hospital later that afternoon, but I made a full recovery, returning to work a month later, after our park had been closed for further evaluation. Hands down, one of my scariest life experiences. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying today's episode. Before we continue, I want to take this opportunity to thank my channel members, Robbie, Bo, Kim, Spunky the Nutcase, Tabitha, Ingrid, Evil's Girl, Corey Shonamon, and our newest members, Zombie Mama, Haiti McDaniel, and Benjamin Wilcox. If you'd like to help support what I do here, along with getting early video access and a shout out, then check out the channel memberships option. It's right next to where it says subscribe. Anyways, let's continue. Number 3. A Grizzly Encounter The job of a park ranger can vary depending on which department you're hired into. While your tasks might be different from, say, someone who works in a totally different park, the title still remains the same. Protecting the wilderness and ensuring the safety of both its inhabitants as well as those visiting. But what happens when its inhabitants decide to become curious? Not in a way you would expect either. Here is just one of my various crazy park ranger stories that comes from my time in the service. At the time I was in my early 40s, and it was around 2001 or 2002. My department had just received a brand new ranger after one of our longtime park rangers had recently retired and I was in charge of showing him the ropes. Now for this story, we're going to refer to him as Drew. One evening, Drew and I were in the office reviewing some documents when we got a call from a fellow ranger whose jeep had broken down deep in the woods. It was something to do with engine failure and one of the tires popping, but that was the least of our concerns. John, the ranger who was stranded, had accidentally tripped in a muddy puddle as he tried to check his vehicle spraining his knee in the process. Talk about a total nightmare, especially considering how late it was in the evening. And on top of that, it was raining like crazy. Anyways, we told them to sit tight, and we advised them to take cover as it was raining. Now, this was actually one of the first times Drew would go with me in the evening, so this made for perfect practice. We grabbed some medical supplies, and we began the roughly 20-minute drive through the wilderness, keeping in communication with John who was stranded. About halfway through our trip to rescue our buddy John, he was complaining of hearing noises in the nearby foliage. Because of the lack of illumination, he wasn't able to make out who exactly was out there, which we could tell by his voice he was starting to get scared. Not that I could really blame him. Anyways, we eventually reached John and head toward a small cave he was taking shelter in so that we could administer first aid. Here's when things got scary. We also started to hear the sounds, but this time we arrived with flashlights, allowing us to find the source. The answer? Bears. At least two large black bears and two bear cubs. We watched them, remaining as silent as we could. As the two larger bears head over to our vehicle, they reach into the back seat grabbing some of our bags. The two cubs then start to roam towards us, eventually being within touching distance. Now, under normal circumstances, I would think having the opportunity to pet a bear would be pretty neat, but when you've got the parents around, that's a whole other problem, especially considering it doesn't take too much to aggravate them. One wrong sound or movement, and you're pretty much guaranteed to be ripped into shreds. So what exactly could we do? Nothing. We had to sit there. And there were a few close calls, 
including at one part where the two large bears approach our hiding spot and they begin to attempt to claw at the three of us. I don't remember it being in an aggressive manner because they don't growl, nor did they look angry. I think it was more in a curious manner. Still, when you've got these giants with razor-sharp claws trying to grab you like you're some sort of toy, I don't care how brave you are. You're bound to have a panic attack. And to this day, how we didn't lose our cool is still beyond me. Oh yeah, and while the bears were interested with their scared little frames, of all times, one of the rangers called me over the radio. I remember thinking, great, you had to call right at this very moment, and now you're alarming the bears. But luckily, I was able to slowly and carefully turn the volume down, further reducing any sudden attack. After what felt like an eternity, but was really about 15 minutes, still that's a long time, the bear seemed to have lost interest and left. We waited an additional 10 minutes, until finally we assisted John into our vehicle, and we drive him back to the park ranger station, where some EMTs were waiting to check in on him. That was essentially it, until a couple of weeks later something interesting, or maybe I should say scary occurred. Unfortunately, we had to close the park due to a bear attack. Thankfully, the person involved survived with minor injuries, but as you can imagine, it chilled the three of us to the bone, especially considering how close we were to these giants. It truly makes you appreciate Mother Nature that much more. Number 4. Stopping at the Right Time Before I moved to Montana to pursue a job with the police department, from 1997 to 2002, I worked as a park ranger under its law enforcement branch for the Grand Canyon National Park. During my years of work, I had to deal with patrolling the vast acreage of million-year-old dirt and crevices which featured some of the most beautiful sunsets and sunrises one can imagine. But along with its breathtaking sights and fresh air came the creepy events to be expected with such a job. This is just one of the many scary stories I have to share. If you're interested in hearing more, then I would be more than happy to send them into the Creepy Fox. Just let me know in the comments and I'll start to write them up. So it all started when myself and another ranger, who we'll refer to as Javier, had stopped to talk to a family of four who had been camping near the north rim of the Grand Canyon. I actually recall them calling us over to invite Javier and I to have dinner with them. They were cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, my personal favorite. Now, as we normally aren't supposed to stop and share food with families, we initially told them no, but after much insisting, we accepted their offer. To this day, I'm so glad we did, and no, it's not because of the amazing food. I'll get to why in a moment. Anyways, the father of the group went on to tell Javier and I how much he appreciated our work, he explained that he served in the army as a medic, and he thought about joining the park ranger service someday. We talked about that for the next 20-30 to 30 minutes, while enjoying the sounds of crickets chirping, and his wife playing guitar with her two daughters. I still remember them doing an amazing cover of the Beatles, still one of my favorite bands. Before we knew it, it was time to leave. Javier and I started to bid them farewell, when all of a sudden we can see a figure begin to make its way toward our campsite. It was dark, but as it got closer, we could see it was somebody in a hoodie. You're all making too much noise. What's somebody gotta do around here to enjoy the peace and quiet? Telling by the brown paper bag and his speech pattern, he was drunk. Normally we can't really say much as he's in nature. But then again, he's in a national park where there's families camping. Also, last thing we want is him heading into an area where he could fall. And well, you know the rest. This was why we ended up approaching him and asking him some questions. He was calm and cooperative at first, until he got angry when I asked him what was inside the brown paper bag, which let's face it, doesn't take a genius to realize what he was drinking. Sir, what are you drinking? Can you please hand it over to me? He gets angry and starts to reach into his pocket, where moments later he's got a knife. Now I did mention we are part of the law enforcement branch of the park rangers, but that didn't mean we were armed. I mean, we did have pepper spray and a 
taser if you want to count that as, air quotations here, armed. But since we aren't technically police officers, we aren't allowed to carry. What happens next was super chilling. He manages to connect with my arm, causing a gash in my uniform and skin. If I could only describe the amount of stinging I felt, then maybe he would begin to understand the pain. Javier manages to taser him before he's able to cause any more damage. The drunken creep falls to the dirt. We secure him with handcuffs, which we also had on ourselves. And then with the help from the father I mentioned earlier, he is able to administer first aid thanks to his medic skills. Javier, meanwhile, radios for backup. Eventually, police arrived, and they're able to arrest him. Through some further investigation, we learned that he had been camping just a few hundred feet from the family, behind some large rocks, which made it nearly impossible for them to see him. I still believe to this day, if Javier and I weren't there, this man would have most likely gone after this family, and they would have been another face in the newspaper. Number 5. Ranger Maintenance I was a park ranger in the early 2000s, working at Yosemite National Park under the maintenance department. This was actually where I found myself one day, when I was sent out to do a repair with a buddy of mine named Josh. So, once we arrive, we get our equipment out of our vehicle, and we get to working almost instantly. It goes by fairly smoothly for the next two to three hours, until we decided to take a break inside the cabin. It was around noon, and we were enjoying the sandwiches and hot cocoa we had packed while listening to music on our portable radio. While eating, Josh points to some movement next to our truck. I didn't see it at first, but then I'm able to see someone in a hoodie attempting to open the passenger door. Forget the fact that they might have been trying to steal our service vehicle, but there's the fact that there are wires and power tools that they could injure themselves with. Josh and I quickly run out of the cabin, and we inform our visitor of the danger, but he didn't seem to care. Instead, he walks over to Josh and I, and he starts to argue. Now, I'm not talking about your typical National Park visitor here, at least from what I was able to determine. He was huge, at least 6 foot 5, 280 to 300 pounds of pure intimidation. Again, we tell him we weren't here to argue. We were just here to do work and inform anybody the area is closed off until further notice. I guess I could best describe these next moments as the customer you get at your store or restaurant that always seems to want to have it their way. It doesn't matter if what they're doing is wrong. They're purposely trying to get in a fight with you. and They want to get you in trouble. Why people do it? I don't know. I guess it's to prove how tough they are. Anyways, I would get my answer moments later, because before I knew it, he grabs a hold of me, and he puts me into a chokehold. This was the point I could smell alcohol in his breath, thus explaining his behavior. I remember beginning to fade in and out of consciousness, when Josh gets the brilliant idea of grabbing his hammer from his belt of tools, and hitting this dude so hard with it in the knee, it buckles. Kind of like when you're at the doctor's and he hits you on the knee to check your reflexes. Except Josh isn't a doctor, and he wasn't checking to see how his reflexes reacted. The dude lets go of his grasp just enough for me to get my feet on the ground, and Josh and I book it back to the cabin. The creep then begins to pound on the front door, demanding we get out, saying that if we were real men, we would fight him. We would have, trust us. But we're on the job. Josh already went after him with a hammer. That was already putting our jobs at risk. Anyways, I get on the radio and contact a couple of rangers who just so happened to be in the vicinity. They arrived with one of our higher-ups no more than three minutes later, but this guy's still kicking at the door, demanding we come out and fight him. Well, luckily, with the help of the four other park rangers, we're able to subdue the man. This was the point when a woman walks out from the woods and sees the commotion. She runs up to us to explain this man was her husband, and they had gotten into a bad argument less than 30 minutes ago. He then decided to walk off on his own after he had been drinking excessively, and that's when he stumbled into Josh and I. Talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Nonetheless, we were able to finish our work, 
A couple of days later, the man and wife came to our park ranger station to personally apologize in person. Believe it or not, I accepted the apology, but that still didn't stop me from pressing charges. I quit less than a year later, and I moved to Hawaii, where I currently work as a marine biologist, which I'd actually gotten a degree for in university. A total 180 from my job in the forestry service. But hey, life happens. Number 6. The Abandoned RV Hey there everyone, former park ranger here to share something quite bizarre. I'm not sure if you would classify this as the scariest story in the world, but if you have a certain fear of what I'm about to describe, then perhaps you might get some chills. Here's what I'm talking about. While working for the United States Forest Service in Alaska, I was head honcho for maintenance. I would essentially drive around the areas I was assigned to with fellow park rangers, and we would clean up any campsites or trash that might have been left behind by campgoers. The good thing up here in Alaska is people are pretty respectful of the rules in nature, and it was very rare to ever spend more than 20 minutes picking up trash. How I longed for something different and exciting, but little did I know I would get more than I bargained for. While on patrol one evening in the middle of the deep woods, in a part of the wilderness that was rarely patrolled, my vehicle headlights shined upon an RV that looked to have been abandoned for weeks. The reason I was able to tell was due to the fact leaves and branches were scattered all over the RV's frame. Now, one of the most important details to look out for here in the Alaskan wilderness is abandoned vehicles. The advice we give to fellow Alaskans is that if you see a vehicle... Let's say a week ago, that vehicle is still there. Chances are something might have happened to the driver. Honestly, I can't tell you how many times in my career we got calls of abandoned vehicles only to have to launch a search party where 9 out of 10 times we find remains. It's super creepy. But out here in the Alaskan wilderness where people think they're experts in the wild, it's a fairly common and creepy sight. Anyways... I go ahead and exit my vehicle, and I do an immediate search of the surrounding forest. After finding no sort of campsite or signs of activity, I begin to approach the RV, knocking on the front door and asking if anybody was there. Thirty seconds of silence, I decided to attempt opening the door, which opened with ease. Inside was a mess. Trash and clothes had been scattered around the floor. Dishes had also been left in the sink, with mold forming and there is just this overall musky smell. But that wasn't the scariest thing. I almost jumped out of my shoes when I see a person staring back at me from the back of the end of the RV. Well, I thought it was a person. Instead, it was a mannequin. Remember how I told you if you have a certain fear of something, the story might get to you? Well, I didn't have a fear of inanimate objects before this, but now I do. Anyways, after having the scare of a lifetime... I see a table sitting right next to the mannequin. That's where I couldn't believe my eyes. I kid you not. A skull sitting on top of a book. Next to both was a knife and on the table was also a hand-drawn pentagram. Immediately I thought this had to have been some sort of strange ritual site, which was further proven when I opened the book and I see a bunch of passages about sacrifices and other things I'd rather not mention here. Anyways... I went ahead and called for police, as well as other park rangers. Now sorry to burst your bubble, but no, nobody popped out at me, and nobody tried to attack me. Instead, we ended up testing the skull, which turned out to be a fake. It was a pretty convincing skull, however. As for who might have left the RV there, we never were able to determine that, since there were no license plates or other sorts of documentation that might have led us to a possible owner. It's a mystery that still remains unsolved in our department to this very day. Number 7. Wolves of the Lake There's an old saying that goes, anything can happen in Mother Nature. It's just a matter of when and where. My when and where would occur during one of my days off when I took my two sons with me to go fishing in the national park I work at as a park ranger. We had been sitting by a river most of the day, enjoying each other's company and telling stories of my time serving in the army, 
when we began to hear rustling in the woods. One of my sons joked that it must have been some bears watching us and waiting to eat us for dinner, which upset my younger son. For context, the oldest one is 12, and the younger one is 9. Anyways, I ensured them it was just the sound of the wind, and we get back to fishing. Fast forward no more than 5 minutes later, my sons are distracted, and I was grabbing a soda from the cooler. This was when I saw a pair of eyes staring back at me from the bushes. It was soon joined by another set of eyes, and then another. I got the chills when three wolves come walking out of the bushes, and they begin making their way towards us. Instantly, I went into full protective dad mode, but I had to be careful about doing so. I only had a hunting knife as protection, and it was three against one. Chances are we weren't making it home, Bear in mind, my two sons are still focused on their fishing lines, and they hadn't yet been made aware of our sudden visitors. What was I to do? I could think of only one option. Attempt to scare them. Sure, on paper it sounds like a genius idea, but what if it didn't work? What if instead the wolves take this as a, hey, you think you're tough? We're tougher. Bring it on. Sort of mentality. It's the only thing I was able to act upon, as with the most intimidating and loudest voice I could muster, I cursed those wolves out like the sailor I was. My plan actually works, and the three of them book it into the woods. I believe my son's sudden yelps from my voice, along with my language, was enough to send these wolves packing. I then stood there keeping a defensive position for my sons for two minutes, until we realized they weren't coming back. Needless to say, we cut our fishing trip short, and we returned home later that evening to arrive to some awesome Domino's pizza. I know that last part isn't so important, but it's pizza. Everyone loves pizza. Number 8. The Angry Driver Today I work in law enforcement in Toronto, Canada, but although I could spend the next hour telling you about some of the crazy arrests and police chases I've been a part of, Today I want to focus on something a little bit different. I saw the creepy fox was asking for some park ranger stories, and I figured since I used to be a park ranger in the late 1990s, I could entertain you all with a real-life, chilling experience. Also, if you're interested in hearing stories from my time in law enforcement, I'd be more than happy to share them with you. Anyways, allow me to take you with me as we head back to the late 1990s, a time when social media was just a fantasy, and kids and families spent their summer afternoons camping, exploring, and backpacking. This was where I found myself working for the United States Forestry Service in the Pacific Northwest. I would patrol nature, as well as help out any individuals who might have required assistance. One time, I got a call to be part of a search and rescue team, which in itself was pretty crazy. It involved me with assisting a team of search and rescuers, trying to help a man who had gotten stuck at the bottom of a ravine. But that's not the scary story I have to share. I just wanted to quickly mention it. Anyways, I was responding to a call about a disturbance at one of the campgrounds that was located near a popular lake. All I was told was there were two dads that were fighting over a camping spot. It happens quite often, which is why we have a rule of first come, first serve. It didn't take me too long to see what was happening. As two teenagers approach my vehicle, and they tell me some man was driving around in his truck and destroying tents and camping supplies. I asked them where the rest of the families were, and they told me they had run to the other side of the lake to avoid this guy's sudden wrath. I went ahead and called for backup, then I got into my vehicle and drive over to the man who had now gotten out of his truck. Excuse me sir, but I understand you're upset over something. Let me help you, it's the least I can do. Apparently when you're kind to someone who's already angry, it only makes things worse. You see he begins to curse at me and he explains he was saving this camping spot for himself and his family, but when he got here. A family had already taken it. I advised him once again that there was no rule for reservations, which means if you're not here, the spot's not yours. 
he grows even more furious as he now jumps back into his truck and bumps into my front end. The man was clearly acting like a maniac and here I was caught up in the middle. I keep telling him to knock it off and the police are already on the way but he doesn't seem to care. He just keeps pushing at my vehicle. I suddenly got the chills when I realized he was trying to back me up into the lake. That would have been a whole other situation in itself. Thankfully, two park rangers and about four officers showed up and just like that, it's like a switch flipped in his head because he puts his foot on the brakes and then he comes out with his hands up. He was handcuffed and after given a breathalyzer test, it was determined he was under the influence. That's why he was arrested and neither myself nor my fellow park rangers heard or saw him ever again. Number 9. A Close Encounter To be quite honest with all of you, I'm not really sure if this is classified as scary. Don't get me wrong, I may have never seen my family again if I would have made the wrong move. A part of me laughs anytime I share this with family and loved ones. What occurred was two years ago, when I was finishing up some administrative paperwork inside of our park ranger station. All of the other park rangers had left for the Thanksgiving holiday and the only thing keeping me company was the sound of rain hitting the windows and the distant thunder that rolled over the mountains. By the time I was finished, it was nearing 11 p.m. and I was struggling to keep my eyes open. I couldn't wait to get home where my wife had left me some microwavable chicken alfredo pasta with vegetables, my perfect combination after a long and tiring day. So I went ahead and turned the lights off, and then I start to close up. When I went outside, I began to hear shuffling coming from the dumpster. Since we're in the woods, we oftentimes get raccoons who go through the trash. It's not that we don't mind them, it's just that they make a huge mess, and we're the ones that have to clean up after them. That's why I went ahead and make my way to the back of the building, thinking I would be chasing away these masked little bandits. But I was in for quite a surprise. I hadn't startled a family of raccoons. Instead, it was a family of bears. All of a sudden, my body froze as the bears became startled and started to make their way toward me. There was nothing I could do. In case you weren't aware, bears can easily outrun human beings. I wouldn't have had enough time to make it to my car or unlock the building even if I wanted to. I pretty much stood there already accepting the outcome, but to my surprise, the bears run past me. Okay, so you're telling me all those cliche plots in dinosaur movies where the hero avoids being eaten by not moving is true? Well, maybe it was because of how dark it was, and the fact I had dark clothing. That might have been enough camouflage to avoid being eaten. That didn't stop me from passing out from the rush of fear. Now, I didn't know how long I had been out for, but I'd estimate it was at least 15 to 20 seconds, since it took me an additional minute of laying in the mud to realize what had just happened. I actually had to take a seat and recollect my thoughts before I called up a buddy of mine to come pick me up. I did make it home 45 minutes later than what I originally planned. But I was just happy to be in bed. Like I said at the beginning, it's not the scariest story in the world, unless of course you take the context into consideration. Just imagine being out in a forest in the middle of nowhere, only for bears to come running at you. I don't think the bravest of you could honestly say you wouldn't have had some sort of reaction. Also, to the bears who didn't chew me up, thank you. I owe you a bunch of jars of honey. Before we get to the final story, I just wanted to go ahead and give you all a quick reminder. If you're ever looking for extra content, whether it be art, previews, or sneak peeks, then make sure to follow me over on my Instagram, at the Creepy Fox Official. Thanks, I'll see you there. But for now, let's get on to our final entry. Number 10. Unexpected Visitor This story is a bit different 
because I wasn't on the clock when this occurred. Still, I figured since you all like to hear stories from park rangers like myself, I would go ahead and submit my story. So here we go. During the summer of 2018, I had promised my two kids I would take them on a camping trip as part of a father and son's bonding trip. It was a long time coming, especially considering my job saw me working 40 hours a week and it was quite often I had to work overtime. But I was able to secure this weekend. What should have been fun in the woods, teaching my kids about survival and nature, turned into a real life nightmare when we got an unexpected visitor. Now, I don't want to spend the next five minutes explaining all the details that led up to the encounter, so instead, I'll get straight to it. It's around 10.30 p.m., and my kids and I are inside the tent. Both of them were asleep, and I was up reading a Harry Potter book, using a lantern as some light. While I was lost in the world of magic and plot points, I started to notice what sounded like footsteps. Since I was so focused, I wrote them off as my imagination, but it got to the point where I could no longer deny the sounds. That's why I grab my pistol, and I start to scan our campsite, but I don't see a thing. While thinking I'm getting too old for my own good, I use this opportunity to get up and go and pee behind some trees. Once I was done, I start to make my way back to the tent, and that's when I see them. Someone in a hoodie, trying to make their way into the tent. I panicked, automatically thinking about my kids, which was why I raised my voice and acknowledged this unexpected visitor. Excuse me, but what in the world are you doing out here at this hour? They turn around and I see it's a man. He's about 6 foot, 160 to 170 pounds. Pretty scrawny, to be honest. Anyways, he explains that he was just looking for some food and wasn't sure if anybody was here. Yeah, because finding a tent with a campfire still lit was going to indicate it's abandoned. Whatever, buddy. Well, I decided to give him a leftover can of chili thinking that would be the last time I see him. Instead, he does a complete 180, revealing a knife. He then demands I hand over any valuables I had. If only he knew the grave decision he had just made. I tell him to back off, revealing I was packing a pistol, and he pulls off another 180. You know, uh, one thing you should know was, I was just joking. C come on, you don't think I would actually consider robbing you, would you? I tell him to get to Steppen, but he wastes no time booking it, dropping the can of chili I'd given him. As for the rest of the camping trip, we called it off early, and we head back home. To this day, I still don't know if he was really just trying to get some extra food, or he was actually using it as a distraction to gain my trust only to attempt to rob me. Next time, pal, Consider those you're trying to steal from. You'll find that some of us aren't that naive. 